our scripture this morning. Romans 8. But it's the end. So Romans 8, 35 through 39. You made it. It's been months in the... When did we start Romans 8? Does anyone remember? A couple months ago? Years? Years? People are saying years? Okay. Funny. It's been months. We've been waiting for this. We've been working up to it. So Romans 8, 35 through 39. Uh, just a heads up, after we finish Romans 8, next week we will begin going through the Gospel of Mark. We'll start in chapter 1, verse 1. So if you want to read ahead, uh, you can go ahead and do so. But today we're in Romans 8, 35 through 39. Let us hear God's word. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us go to God for a moment of prayer. O oh, holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Now, I get why you might jokingly say it was years ago or last year when we started Romans 8. 2020 kind of feels that way, doesn't it? It, 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 has that, it kind of has that feeling to it. I mean, uh, it, it, everything just seems to be taking a little bit longer than it normally does. Am I right? Yeah. And so here we are. We're in Romans 8. We've been building up to this, and, and I even slowed us down a bit, and we went a couple verses at a time there for a moment, and we've been waiting to get to this. You know, Romans 8, 38 and 39 are some of uh, people's favorite scripture out of the entire Bible, just the beauty of it. But we're going to wait till the end to get to it. We're going to wait a little bit longer. For you see, it, Paul's been building up to this. Paul's been writing. He begins in verse 1 by telling us, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he talks all through Romans 8 that we now have the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, that is living permanently in us. And we get the Holy Spirit power to daily kill our sin. That we can walk in the Spirit and, and we're purposed to be more like Christ in our walk, in our, in our daily lives. The, the more we mature, the closer we get, the more like Jesus we are to be. And all through this, Paul is reminding us that our salvation is secure in Christ. For he is the one who knew no sin, that took on our sin. And went to the cross and shed his blood as an atonement, our substitute, to satisfy God's justice so that we might be righteous, so that you would be saved. And three days later, he was resurrected and we became co-heirs with Christ to the promise of resurrection over sin and death. For you see, Paul also wrote in Romans, and it was in chapter 5, verse 8, that while we were yet sinners, when we didn't deserve it, when we had no reason or business being loved by God, God sent Jesus to die for us, proving God's love for us. And so here in Romans 8, Paul continues to talk about our salvation in a way that is secure. And then he gets here to the end and he anticipates in an argument, well, can't we lose our salvation? That's possible, right? And begins asking himself questions. He begins by addressing, is there someone that can cause us to lose our salvation? And we covered this last week. He went over, uh, is there someone else? Is, could God change his mind? Uh, what about Satan? Satan could cause us to lose our salvation. Or, or Jesus, Jesus could take it all back. 
or even ourselves, we could cause ourselves to lose our salvation. And the answer through all of that was there's no one. No one can separate us from the love of Christ. Not even ourselves. So then the next question is, well, then is there a circumstance? Is there some circumstance out there that could make Jesus stop loving us? That's the question, right? What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Some of your translations may have who shall separate us, but it's the same Greek word tis that can be translated as who or what in this instance. Earlier we translated as who, and now we translate it as what, because Paul then, after asking this question, gives us an exhaustive list, well, a semi-exhaustive list of circumstances, right? We see after he says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, the sword. It's quite a list Paul makes. I think he does so with purpose. But again, he's going to answer the question, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? When we look at that question, it's not what shall separate our love from Jesus, right? It's what shall separate his love from us. See, we can't be separated from Christ. It's him that loves us, right? It's the scripture that says we love him because he first loved us. Our love comes because he loved us. And remember, he loved us when we were the most unlovable, while we were yet sinners. So what in the world is there that can break the bond of Christ's love? What is there? Paul makes the list. What about tribulation? Trials, tribulation. Tribulation being when we're cornered and, and we're out of options and we tend to be under immense pressure. It's, it's those moments of suffering, the trials and the tribulations we face. It's the pressure in the midst of our suffering. When the pressure's on and there's a price to pay for being a believer. Does, does that separate you from the love of Christ? But what about distress? Distress being this inward difficulty, what we call temptation. Being in distress, being tempted. You know, Jesus, in the midst of his temptation, he was in the desert 40 days and tempted by Satan. And what God did was able to help him bear the temptation. Same is true for us, right? Paul just got done telling us we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We have the power to daily put our sin to death. That temptation that we are in the midst of, that God doesn't leave us, but God will help us bear it. He gives us a way to bear it. Well, what about persecution? Now, persecution, we're talking real persecution here. When others who reject Christ bring about mental and physical harm upon believers. Physical and mental suffering is brought upon you simply because you believe in Jesus. What about persecution? Can that separate you from the love of Christ? Now, remember, Paul is doing something interesting here. Paul doesn't know this, but God does. So Paul writes this letter to Christians in Rome. In a little while, it's going to be Nero, Caesar, who begins the persecution upon Christians. They're going to go into the Colosseum and they're going to fight beasts. They're no better than a piece of meat hanging in a butcher's shop. They're treated as candles. They'll be thrown over with tar and oil, and they used to light the streets or Nero's party. They are the Roman candles. Persecution. Does Christ stop loving you when you're being persecuted? See, these are interesting questions Paul asks. 
Because I think at some level, we ask them of ourselves too. We get to a point in our life, maybe we're in the midst of suffering, something bad has happened to us, and we begin the question, well, what did I do to make God mad at me? God doesn't love me anymore, does he? Especially when we begin getting into that long-standing suffering or a trial or a tribulation that seems to never end, begin to question it. But here Paul is saying there is no circumstance under which Christ stops loving you. So he says, what about famine? Nakedness. To be without food and and to be poor and, and destitute. Can that separate you? Or even on another level, maybe God calls you to a vocation and yet you don't end up being as successful in life as you had hoped. Does that mean God has stopped loving you? Danger, Paul asked. What about danger? When people plot against you. Or the sword which Paul uses to mean death. Maybe that's one we really struggle with. As we mature, we begin to realize and can look back on the trials, tribulations, the suffering, the persecution, the distress, the the famine, the nakedness that we have gone through, the danger, the plots against us, and, and say, you know what? When we really look back at this, God was with us every step of the way. There wasn't a moment in my life that God wasn't loving me. And we get to death. We really love Jesus. But it scares us a little bit. Will it hurt? We're, sometimes we're not ready to let go of everything that's here. To grab on to the Father who's there. You know, despite all of the assurances the Word of God gives us, we still have slivers of doubt, don't we? Because it means of letting go of one, this life that we know, to grab hold of the life yet to come. So Paul asks, even in death, in our death, Does Christ stop loving us in our death? You know what's interesting about this list? As Paul himself writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in which he lists off every item on this list. Paul himself experienced tribulations and distress and famine and nakedness and danger and and ultimately would face the sword. So Paul speaks here from a position of experience, of knowledge. So he keeps writing in verse 36. He says, as it's written, and he quotes Psalm 44, verse 22. And he says, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Thanks for those encouraging words, Paul. But essentially what Paul is saying here is that these circumstances are not unique to you. But God's people for all time have endured these circumstances. And for all time, God has continued to love them as he loves you. So we find confidence in that. But he also writes for your sake. It's for God's sake. We suffer because it's also there in 2 Corinthians 11 where Paul points out that when we boast, we don't boast in our strengths, but we boast in our weaknesses because it's when we boast in our weaknesses, we display God's great glory. We couldn't overcome our sin, so we boast how sinful we were because it demonstrates how gracious and loving he is. We boast that we couldn't prevent ourselves from suffering, 
because it demonstrates that in the midst of the suffering, we have a Father in heaven who loves us without conditions. So can any of this separate us from the love of Christ? Paul answers, no. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. No, we are more than conquerors. What does he mean by this? How are we more than conquerors if we are simply bearing the trials, tribulations, and the distress, and the persecution, the famine, the nakedness, the dangers, and the death? How are we more than conquerors? Oh, it's because of Christ. Remember, we became co-heirs with Christ upon his resurrection. And we too are promised that resurrection. So on that day in which we reach the Father in heaven, all of these things go away. Paul wants us to remember when we're asked, how are we doing? Don't put yourself under the circumstances of today. Put yourself under the love of Christ, because that's where you are. That's where you have been, and that's where you will be from today forevermore. For you see, Christ is loving us now. He loved us yesterday. He loves us now. And the promise found in God's word revealed through Jesus Christ is that he is going to love you tomorrow. You're going to wake up and God's love is still going to be resting with you. This is why in the midst of all of these circumstances we face that our only hope in life and in death is that we are not our own, but that we belong to God. We are held in his hands. So for months now, what seems like years, we've been in Romans 8. And Romans 8 began with that first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a powerful word that is. This word is a sunrise, powerful and bright. Early in the morning, this word brings us courage to live boldly, to walk in the love of Christ. And so it is in verse 38 and 39 that God's word is a gorgeous sunset. One that when we gaze upon, it brings us peace. We know of a hope, not only for today, but a hope for tomorrow, a hope that's everlasting, that we can rest with tranquility. So today, I want to leave you with this sunset. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hallelujah Hallelujah. and amen.